Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of Twitter users and we're going to try to classify the gender of a given user uh, based on a series of data. Now these genders were actually um, hand labeled by users. Uh, you can see here, uh, basically users were asked to go in and make a, a basically figure out what the gender was by looking at the profile. So we have the gender and then also a gender confidence column, uh, which is how confident the user was that that profile matched the gender they chose. And I believe for each, um, for each example, there were three different uh, judgments. So it's not, um, these, these are, I mean, fairly reliable. Um, additionally, we note that there are three possible genders, male, female, or brand because uh, some of these are brand accounts. So we're going to try to predict the gender of a given uh, record based on a bunch of features. We have uh, 26 columns in total. Um, all right, so let's hop into the notebook and we're going to use a deep recurrent neural network with multiple inputs to make our predictions. So I'm gonna import uh, our standard libraries, NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. And then we're gonna get a matplotlib.pyplot and Seaborn for visualization. And for pre-processing, uh, I guess these can go together. This is all our pre-processing stuff. We're gonna use the tokenizer and pad sequences function from keras.preprocessing, and the standard scalar and train test split function from sklearn. Uh, then we're using TensorFlow to build and train our model, and we're going to analyze the results afterwards with a confusion matrix and classification report from sklearn.metrics. All right, so, uh, Say so getting started, and let's um, first we'll load in the data using pandas.readcsv, and we can get the file path through over here. Here's the CSV file. I'm going to paste it in, and we can take a look. Oh, I didn't actually import. Okay, so we're, we're loading it in. We're taking a look. Uh, just give it one moment while it imports, and then I want to. Uh, oh, okay. So this happens sometimes if uh, the encoding is a little off. I'm not sure exactly why it happens, but you can fix it by uh, typing encoding equals Latin one. That will load in properly now and we can take a look. All right, and the uh, first thing uh, to check for is if we have these dot, dot, dots. If we have the dot, dot, dots, it means we can't see all the columns and I would like to see all the columns. So I'm gonna go into the console and type pandas.setOption. Whoops, uh, pandas.setOption max columns, uh, none. This way we have no, no limit on how many columns so we can see, and if we reload it, we can now see all of the columns. All right, so, um, looks like we have some cleaning to do. I mean, this, this data set looks, um, looks like it has a good number of features, but they are not in uh, machine readable form right now. So let's get a little information with data.info. And we can see, uh, wow, so in, in these two, there's actually 50 non-nulls. Uh, so all the rest are nulls. So uh, one thing I noticed when taking a look at this, we have these golden uh, values. And supposedly it says uh, golden, whether the user was included in the gold standard for the model. So I guess these were the original 50 examples and then users were asked to sort of like replicate the kind of data that was collected for these original 50. So um, there's a column in here, last judgment at, uh, where if for those 50, there are no values in it. So I'm not sure if we're gonna use those 50 values because it has some missing values associated with them. Um, so the gold column we may drop, but we'll, we'll take a look. So. Uh, in addition, we have some other ones with very with uh, quite a few missing values, uh, so we're probably gonna have to drop some columns here. Uh, let's start pre-processing the data, and we can start by getting a little information first about the missing values. I think is good. So if we get uh, data dot is na, it will give us the true false matrix where true means there's a missing value in that location. So if we sum this across the rows we'll get the total number of missing values in each column, which is extremely useful. However, what's even more useful is to know the percentage of missing values. And for that, we can do 
uh, dot mean instead. If you think this is summing all the trues down the row, uh, mean would just sum all the trues and then divide by the length. So we get the percentage of missing values in each column. And here we can see um, some of these are, this is 99.7% missing. Uh, this one as well. This one's only 18%. Uh, this is 99%. So uh, these two are both fairly high as well. So we're going to probably, the first thing we'll do, let's let's create a function called preprocess inputs. And we're going to pass in a data frame. So we'll refer to the data frame as df from now on inside the function. And I'll start by creating a copy of it so we're not accidentally modifying data. We want to keep data as it is and keep applying these transformations to a copy. And uh, for now, we'll return df. So we're going to feed df through, apply some transformations, and then return it at the end. Uh, so what we can do is filter out some of these um, columns. Columns with, so we'll say, uh, let's drop columns with over, how about 30% missing values? That sounds decent to me. Uh, it's a okay threshold. I mean, if, if a column exceeds 30% missing values, then we're going to have to fill, um, basically the more missing values there are, the more we have to fill with fabricated data. And also the, like for example, if we fill with the mean, the mean is uh, being generated from a smaller and smaller subset of the data. So. Uh, we're probably just going to drop these uh, at the bottom and use 30% as our threshold. So what we can do is create, uh, we, we can get here, for example, data sub gender. Um, no, actually, okay, let's let's first drop, let's do a, uh, an initial cleaning before we get into the missing values. There are actually some columns here uh, that are not useful. For example, the unit ID. This is going to be unique for every, uh, for all 20,000 examples. So it provides no useful information to us. Um, what else? The profile image. Now, I suppose we could actually, if we wanted to, if we really wanted to optimize the uh, performance of the model, we could actually uh, write some code that would access the image, download the image, and then like run it through a convolutional neural network um, as actual image data. But I'm not going to do that for today's video. I would be very involved. So I'm just going to drop this column as well. Uh, name as well, we do not need because this is going to be unique for each uh, example. And anything else here? Just trying to see. Oh, this one, tweet ID, also unique for each one. Um, OK, so those four, let's just drop those to start off. So. We'll say uh, drop unnecessary columns. So df equals df dot drop, and we're going to plug in all those now. So we had unit ID. This was unnecessary. Uh, we had what was the other one? Next one we had was uh, name was unnecessary. Um, I believe profile image, right? And oops. Comma should be outside. Last one was tweet ID. So these four we're not going to use. So we're going to drop it from axis one, which is the column axis. And now if we run this and we, let's say, uh, let's call it X for now. Not so great, but uh, X equals preprocess inputs passing in data. Take a look at X. Uh, we can see uh, we have dropped those particular columns that we needed. We now have 22 columns as opposed to the original um, 26. So f those four columns were dropped. All right, and I actually don't want to return DF. I want to return our inputs and the target separately. So what I'm going to do is split DF into X and Y. And then instead of returning DF, return X and Y. So Y is going to be just what we're trying to predict. So it's going to be just the gender column. That's what we're trying to predict here. So I'm going to make a copy of it and store it in Y. And X is going to be everything except the gender column. So this is what we're using to predict the gender. So I'm going to make a copy of that as well after I drop it from axis 1. OK, so now if I run this and I get X comma Y equals preprocess inputs, I can see X. And I can also see Y, which is just the gender column. 
All right, so now let's do this. Drop columns with over 30% missing values. Um, now there's one thing before we do this to note is that the, where is it? Gender column actually has some small percentage of missing values. And if the gender itself has missing values, uh, we can't make predictions on those on those examples because there there's no label. So let's first drop this 0.4% of the examples that have mi missing values in the target column and then we will go on to drop the other columns. So uh, encode okay actually let's take a look first. Uh, here's our y right. Let's take a look at the unique values in y. So this is what we're trying to predict and you can see we have male, female, brand and then unknown. So unknown is actually a missing value, right? We don't have data there. We're, we, we're not going to try to predict if a example is unknown or not. So why don't we encode unknowns to be NANs? So uh, encode unknown values in the target column as numpy.nan. And uh, for this, it's very simple. We just take the gender column and we do dot replace. We're replacing unknown with numpy.nan. And we're going to set the gender column to equal that. All right, now if we run this, check it out. Uh, we no longer have unknown in here. We just have three values and then the missing values. So now we're going to go ahead and drop the missing values. So drop rows with missing target values. So uh, we want to gather up all the rows in the gender column that have missing values. And to do this, well, let's take a look at our gender column. And we can um, get the isNA vector for this, which will be true if there's a missing value. And then we can index uh, the, the original data frame with this true false vector. So as long as you have a vector of trues and falses that matches the index of the data frame, you can use a true false um, series to index. So now this returns only the 97 rows where we have missing values in the gender column. <coughs> so um, now if we type dot index, we get just the indices. And we can use this to, uh, we can say drop these indices from the data frame. So let's call it gender NAs. And this is going to be a list of the indices. So I'm going to grab this. And all I have to do is replace this with DF because within the function I'm calling data DF. So this will be the indices stored in gender NAs. And then we go ahead and DF equals DF.drop gender NAs from axis 0 since this is the row axis. And anytime we drop uh, rows, as long as we um, don't really care about uh, uniquely identifying um, each example with an index, like if we don't want to preserve the indices, it's a good idea to reset the index after because there will be missing indices otherwise. So I'm going to also include drop equals true when we reset the index. Uh, this allows, th this prevents the old indices from becoming a new column in the data frame. So I'm going to run this, run this, run this. And uh, we can see if we check this now, all the missing, all the unique values in our prediction is male, female, and brand. So there's no more missing values. We have lost some data, but it's not substantial. Uh, we had 20,000 originally, now we're down to 18,800, so still doing well. Um, okay, so now let's actually go ahead and do this. So let's drop columns with over 30% missing values. So there's a few of them here. Um, we can access the ones that have 30% uh, or more by taking this and just asking is a given value over 0.3. And we'll get trues uh, in any of the columns that have over 0.3. So this description one uh, made it through because it's 18, right? So it's false, but this gender gold one, which is 99.7, uh, made uh, is true. So we're going to try to drop all the ones that have true here. 
So um, if we use this, we, again, we can use this as an index, um, this time as a column index. So we can't just say data sub this thing. We have to do data dot columns sub this thing to get all the column names uh, that have true here. And we check that. These are all the column names with over 0.3 uh, or over 30% missing values. So what I'm going to do is take this and down here I'm going to create something called missing calls which is just this and I'm going to return the data with uh, re replace the data with df. Uh, so all that will be is the column names uh, where we have more than 30% missing values. And all we have to do is say df equals df dot drop missing calls from access one. All right, run this, run this, run this, run this. Uh, we now have 16 columns from our original uh, uh, 26. But if we take a look at x dot is na now, we only have two columns with remaining missing values. So uh, that's pretty good. Uh, the description as well. To, uh, it's important to understand what kind of data is in these two columns. Uh, the last judgment at is uh, it's a date time column and there's only 50. So we could fill these. Well, what I'm going to do is create a bunch of new columns uh, with the year, month, day, hour, um, times, uh, values from, from the original date time. And then we could fill the means for each of those for these missing values. But since there's only 50, and maybe I'm feeling a little lazy, I'm just going to drop those 50 rows. Um, it's, it's not like a big loss. It's, it'll be all right. So uh, drop, well, I'll say, all right, there are only 50 remaining missing values in the, I think it's called last judgment at. Oops. So let's drop those rows. All right, so um, we're gonna do what we did up here, right? So just the very same thing, I'm gonna copy that in, except we'll call this instead of gender NAs, we'll call it judgment NAs. And this will be the last judgment at column. So we're getting the indices, storing it in judgment NAs, and then we're dropping judgment NAs from axis zero and resetting the index afterwards. Um, okay, running this, running this, and then checking the missing values. We now only have missing values in the description column. And we still have 18,000 examples, so it's not really, it's not a big loss that uh, since we dropped those 50, column, uh, 50 rows. Uh, but if you if you really want to keep them, go ahead. Um, you can go into the notebook and encode them uh, as you like. Uh, so the description column, this is a text column, and this is actually very important, right? This this uh, probably has a lot of information uh, about a person's gender. I I'm you know you can't be sure, but um, this is what how people describe themselves. So I'm sure there's a sort of some sort of correlation between uh, the way people describe themselves and uh, what gender a given person uh, identifies with. So uh, what we're not going to do any sort of dropping for here uh, because the way we're going to encode this is as a sequence of words, and simply for a missing value in the description. Uh, will be a sequence of all zeros, which is fine, and that's not actually a missing value. All right, so um, what we can do then, if we want to encode these as uh, strings of all zeros, we should definitely uh, change the missing values to be empty strings, so that when we run this through a tokenizer, which uh, we're going to do in just a moment, uh, all the, the empty strings will just go to a row of zeros. So um, here then, we'll say, uh, let's, let's encode the missing values 
in the description column as empty strings. Uh, so for this, very easy, we just grab the description column from, from df, and we use dot fill na, which will fill the missing values with a given value, and the value we're gonna give it is just the empty string. And that's gonna be our new column. All right, so now we run through one more time, take a look, we now have no more missing values. We are totally done with missing values and we're good to proceed. And we still have 18,700 rows, so a lot of data. Uh, let's see what we, we should do next. Um, now we're probably gonna be dealing with data types. And um, for data types, a really useful uh, way to analyze what kind of data we're working with is by taking a look at what are some of the unique values inside each categorical variable. So for the numerical variables, for all these uh, numerical columns, we're, we don't need to do anything. We, um, they're already ready to be fed into the model, uh, maybe after some scaling. But for these guys, well, for example, um, this unit state or this link color, which is, this is a color value, uh, these need to be transformed in some way so that they can be fed into the model. So, um, I think, well, there's one, there's a few columns in here that we already know how we want to encode them, which is the date time columns. I believe there's two of them. Uh, no, three of them. There's the last judgment at column, the created column, and the tweet created column. So what I'm going to do is create a bunch of new columns based on the data that's in each one. So right here, uh, let's create date slash time columns. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to use pandas dot to date time, which is a very useful function that takes, uh, we'll use X here, and we'll, we'll just grab a, a column. How about the created column? and it's going to return uh, the same column, but in a date time format. You can see the data type is, is now date time instead of a string. And the great thing about uh, date time is that we can actually access uh, the year with dot year, the month with dot month, the day with dot day, hour with dot hour, and so on. So we can just easily extract different bits of information from the date time column using that uh, scheme. So here, what I'm going to do is for each column in, and I'm going to list all the date time columns, we have last judgment at, we have created, and we have tweet created. For each one, df sub column is going to equal df sub column dot, uh, actually no, it's going to be pandas dot to date time of the column. So this is just going to convert each one of these uh, daytime columns into actual daytime format so that we can uh, create these new columns now uh, from the old ones. So let's use the last judgment at column first. Uh, if we, uh, we can apply a lambda function to this column that will it'll apply this anonymous lambda function to each value x in the column. So it will go down the column. Um, we're doing last judgment at, so one by one, it'll grab one of these. So x is a given one of these. And we're going to change x into x.year. And so because this will be turned into a daytime format, it'll just grab the year. Uh, and we're going to store this in a new column. Let's call it uh, judgment year. And now if we take a look, uh, if we process it, our x, um, you can see here's our, it's been converted to a date time format, and at the end we have the year right there. Uh, so, it, we can see we can easily create these new date time features from the column using this sort of a encoding scheme. So what I'm going to do is just copy this and do it for month, for day, and for hour. I don't think minute or second is useful. Uh, so this will just be month, this will be day, and this will be hour. And then over here, uh, we're just gonna change the name of each column 
accordingly. And if we take a look now, uh, we should have four new columns at the end. The year, month, day, and hour taken from the original values. All right, so now what we can do is just do that for the other two as well. So this is created. So we'll call it created year, created month, created day, created hour, and just gonna paste created in for each of these. Oops. And then tweet created, so we'll call it uh, tweet year, tweet month, tweet day, tweet hour. And I'm gonna paste tweet created in for each of these. Then when we're done, uh, we can drop uh, the original columns the original daytime columns, which we now have extracted the features from. So I'm going to drop, uh, df.drop, and I'll just grab this list here and drop all those from axis one. Now let's take a look. Uh, we should have nine, uh, no, actually uh, 12 new columns at the end. All these 12 new columns with the information taken from the original uh, daytime columns. And we've dropped the originals. All right, so we're getting somewhere. We just have a few more to deal with here. Um, let's see what else. So, um, I guess we should just move on and just deal with the description and text now. So this is the big one. We're going to try to, uh, we're, we're actually gonna feed these bits of information in separately because we're not gonna include this in the original, uh, in the X. The reason is um, we want a sort of different way of, of uh, encoding these um, in the model itself. So I'm gonna feed this in as a sequence and feed this in as a sequence of tokenized integers. Um, we're tokenized words where each word is mapped to a unique integer. And I'm going to feed the rest of the data in separately. So let's create a new function up here called get sequences. And this will take uh, a list, well, it'll be a panda series of uh, texts, we'll call it. And we're gonna specify vocabulary length as well, vocab length. Uh, how many of the most frequent words do we want to use? So I'm gonna create a new tokenizer. And this is a tokenizer from Keras.preprocessing. And what this does is essentially looks at a list of words, a list of sentences really, or texts, which in this case will be uh, either a description or a tweet. And it will um, assign each word to a unique integer from one to vocab length. Um, and it's, it does it in terms of, in an order of frequency. So the most frequent word will be given a value of one, the next most frequent will be given a value of two, uh, and so on. Zero is reserved, but uh, this will allow us to encode each word sp uh, specifically as a, an integer. And uh, this tokenizer is really cool. It has a lot of filtering methods built into it. So it's already gonna go through and like filter out any special characters any pure, any punctuation, anything. And then it's going to lowercase uh, the whole thing and then split it on white space. So it will see each word separately. Additionally, um, we're going to use a dense encoding. Uh, a, we're gonna use a, a Keras embedding layer in the model that's going to encode the words as dense representations. Um, so, and it's actually going to learn where to send the words in in, in a vector space. I'll, I'll explain more about this later, but what that means is that uh, we don't have to do a lot of pre-processing on the text because the model will learn uh, if certain words, let's say we have two words, one is misspelled version of the other, uh, the model will learn that those two are similar uh, through training. So we don't have to worry about cleaning up the words so much with this kind of encoding scheme. So actually we wanna specify the number of words we're using, which is just vocab length. Um, and we're going to fit the tokenizer to the texts. So tokenizer.fitOnTexts, passing in texts here. And that will just uh, 
collect all the information about the frequency of each word. And then we're going to create the sequences with tokenizer.texts to sequences, passing in text. So this is the actual transform that's being applied. And we're going to store the result in sequences. Now, when we do this, sequences will, uh, the, each sequence of integers now will be of variable lengths. So I can actually just show you if we return sequences. If we want to call this function on, uh, let's call it on the text column. So, oh, it's called text. Um, we have to give it a vocab length. How about 10,000? Okay, so uh, here are the sequences. This is the first tweet. Each word in the tweet has been encoded to a unique integer in from 1 to 10,000. Uh, and basically, if we look over here, uh, each tweet is of a different length, right? So we actually have uh, varying lengths here. Uh, this is a rather short one, and this one is more of a, a longer one. Uh, so right now, it's not in a great way we can't to feed it into the model with variable uh, length inputs. Uh, so what we're going to do is pad them, pad all the sequences so that they all take the same length. And what that means is just add zeros to the end until they're all of the same uh, length. So for that, we'll use the keras function uh, pad sequences, pass in sequences, and we also have to pack, pass in a maximum length. And we don't actually know the maximum length, so let's go find it out. We'll call it max sequence length. And if we take uh, a list of, uh, how about sequence for sequence in sequences. So this is just a list comprehension that recreates the sequences list, um, except instead of just getting the sequence for each one, let's get the length of the sequence. So this will now be a list of all the lengths for each sequence. And we can get the max with numpy.max of that to get the maximum sequence length. Then we'll plug in max sequence length right here, and we'll be able to pad the sequences accordingly. And let's store that in the new sequences. So now if we run this and run this, uh, what this returns is now a numpy array with uh, a two-dimensional numpy array with zeros uh, in so this padding so that each sequence is of the same length. And I actually want to put the zeros at the end. It doesn't matter so much, but I like putting it at the end. So padding equals post, we'll do that. So now uh, our sequences will be, we can get the shape of this uh, to see the actual dimension. So we have 20,000 examples that will be reduced when we apply it to our actual data set that we've already removed some examples from. But the longest sequence is 104 words long. So each sequence is now 104 with zeros uh, to make up for the missing, the, the shorter ones. All right, so uh, now we're going to use this in our pre-processing. I'm going to, down here, get sequence data for the description and tweet columns. I'll say text columns. So we'll call it desk. Desk will be our description sequences. Okay, so get sequences. The text we're passing in is df sub description, so the description column. And then the vocab length. Now I found that in this for this particular data set, uh, using 20,000 works well. Uh, and I'm just going to do the same thing for the tweets. Passing in the text column here, same vocab length. And then when we're done, we can drop uh, the original description and text columns for Maxis 1. All right, let's take a look. Uh, I should actually, I realize I didn't return it. So instead of returning just X and Y, I'm going to return X desk, tweets, and y. And then here, I'm going to save them in their own variables. And when we pre-process, we have our x, which should no longer have the descriptions uh, or the tweets. 
like here, the, the text columns are gone. But now we also have the description sequences and the tweets sequences. And the shape of these should each be different because they have different maximum lengths. So the description, the longest sequence is 62. And for the tweets, the longest sequence is 104. So we're going to feed these in separately along with x. So these are going to be our three inputs to the model. And then we're, we're going to predict y with these three inputs. All right, so most of the work is done now. Let's um, let's start. In, let's encode the labels. Well, actually, first let's let's work let's work on this. So the color columns. This is a little interesting. Encode color columns. Uh, now we could do this as a one-hot encoding. So let me take a look at something down here. I'm going to get a dictionary that maps uh, a column name to the length of unique values in that column. So we're going to get for each for each column we're going to get the number of unique values in a column for every column in x.columns. So all right, we have uh, that's actually interesting. We have a number of columns now with only one value. So we're going to want to drop all of those. Those aren't giving us any useful information uh, since they all take the same value. So maybe we should just do that before we proceed. Uh, so over here, drop columns with only one value. So df equals df dot drop. And we're going to drop golden. I mentioned we might drop that earlier. Uh, unit state. Trusted judgments. Profile yn. And then the rest of them that have one are actually the, uh, they come from the date time columns that we created. So instead of dropping them explicitly, I'm just never going to create them in the first place. Uh, all three, okay, the so for the judgment, it's the year and month. And for the tweet, it's the year, month, and day. Not useful. So we're going to go up here, drop the year and month. And then here, drop the year, month, and day. So now we run this, run this. Oh, I didn't drop this from access one. One sec. And then let's take a look after that uh, is complete. All right, so we have no more columns with only one value. Uh, we're down to 14 columns now. Uh, so now we have to deal with these link color and sidebar color, uh, color columns. Now, what's interesting about them is that um, they are categorical, right? But not exactly. Like, we could um, we could encode these as one one hot encodings. Uh, so e we create a new column for each unique value in the color possibilities. But if you think about what this is, it's actually something of a continuous variable. Uh, the way these uh, RGB color encodings are created is that the first two co uh, characters are the is the intensity of red in the color. The second two characters is the intensity of green. And the third two color uh, characters are the intensity of blue. And so what we could do is actually take each of these, the, the first two, the second two, and the third two, and create new features out of them, one for red, one for green, one for blue. And that's what I'm going to do. So up here, we're going to create a new function called getRGB that takes in a list of colors. So we're going to pass in a color column and return three new columns uh, that are well, one for the reds, one for the blues, uh, greens, and one for the blues. So at the end, we're going to return R, G, and B. And we're going to take colors and apply a lambda function to each one. So, uh, OK. This is going to be a given color code. So let's get an example of one. How about this? I'm just going to copy this in so we can take a look at what we're doing here. So here is our sample data that's going to be fed through for a given x. We want to get the first two and store it in red. So 
x uh, indexed from 0 to 2, that will just be the first two characters, is going to be our r column. So we're going to copy this down twice more. Now we need one for green and one for blue. For green, it's going to be 2 to 4. That's just these ones. And for blue, it's going to be 4 to 6. That's just the last two here. Um, now, this isn't enough. This is still going to just be a string. So I want to actually convert uh, the this is in this is in base 16, right? In hexadecimal, I want to convert it into decimal in base 10. So uh, Python has a great way of doing this. Uh, you can cast something into an integer in from one base to base 10 using uh, passing in an integer value and then specifying the base. So we're doing base 16, and let's for example let's take co. C0 actually. That's going to be our our integer in base 16 and we're going to try to convert it to base 10 which does happen. So the uh, the largest value that a two digit base 16 number can have is 255. So all these uh, values will take on a range from 0 to 255. Uh, so then this would be our R value, our uh, green value would be this 222, and our blue value uh, would be ed, which is 237. So using this, uh, note that numpy also has its own version of the function, which I will be using. Um, and so we're going to apply this to each uh, sort of section of the original color code. However, um, we have one issue in that some of these color codes, where is it, um, just get set to zero uh, because if you have a string of all zeros, I guess that gets evaluated as just one zero. Uh, so what we are going to do is actually create a new function, just a small helper function here called hex to decimal. That's just going to, it's going to perform this operation first, uh, but with inside the try block, try catch block. So try to return numpy.int x comma 16. So it's going to try to convert it to base 10. And if it finds an error, which is what will happen when it tries to feed in uh, one of, no, uh, where is it? One of, uh, where is the color? One of these, right? Just the zero thing. It's going to throw an error. I, I was testing it before. Uh, so. If we if it throws an error, we're just going to return zero, and you'll see how that works in just a moment. Uh, so now down here, instead of just converting x to the slice of it, uh, we're going to pass it through hex to decimal first. All right, so let's just paste that in for each one, and now, whoops. Now we should be good. So I'm going to use this as my encoding scheme. And then down here, encode color columns as R RGB values. So let's take a look. Let's do it uh, for the link color column. So we have the link color column here. This one has no zeros, so let's just work. I, I mean, actually, it might. I'm not sure. Um, but let's uh, use the, where is it, get RGB on it. So get RGB of the link color column. And this returns three new columns. Uh, we can call them, how about we'll call it DF sub link red uh, and DF sub link green and df sub link blue is get RGB link color. So we'll split it into these three. And let's take a look. And sure enough, we now have RGB values, uh, one for red, one for green, one for blue, taken from the original link color. 
So uh, you can see we have a value of 8 in uh, the reds. So we have 8 here. Uh, we have value of C2, uh, which gets converted to 194 in base 10. So we have that here. And C2 again here, which is another 194. Uh, so now let's just do the same thing for the sidebar color. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm just going to change link to side. So sidebar over here. And I'm just going to grab side and paste it in over here, over here, and over here. So now let's take a look. Uh, and this is why I had that try catch block. Because um, you can see that some of them were encoded as 0. Uh, which was throwing some errors. So now it's just encoded as 0, 0, 0. And that's because up uh, in our function, we have it return 0 when it throws an error. All right, so uh, now we can drop the original color columns. df equals df.drop, link color, and sidebar color from axis 1. All right, and I guess we'll take a look at this now. And I believe we now should have all numerical columns. So no more, uh, this is looking very good. We also managed to greatly reduce the number of columns we have in total by using this encoding scheme. If we used a one-hot encoding for them and treated them as categorical, we would have, uh, I think, thousands of columns. But now we're, we still have 18. Um, and we are looking very good. Everything is numeric, and so I believe we can go and scale the data now. Uh, I should note our Y is still in uh, text form. We have male, female, or brand in here. So let's encode that as uh, 0, 1, and 2. So encode label column. This is very simple. We're just going to create a label mapping. It's going to be a dictionary that maps each label to its corresponding integer value. We'll map female to 0, male to 1, and brand to 2. And then all we have to say is df sub uh, gender equals df sub gender dot replace. And we can actually just pass in the mapping straight to replace. And that will do the mapping for us for each value. All right. And now. Uh, I'm not even going to check. It's just going to. I'll show you after. We're going to scale the x. So scale x with a standard scalar. So a standard scalar. I'm going to create a new object of it. Uh, this is from sklearn, and this will give each column in x a mean of zero and a variance of one. So x equals scalar dot fit transform will do the job, passing in x here. Uh, so this will allow each column to take on a very similar range of values and will improve the model's performance. I would like to note that this returns a NumPy array, so I'm going to convert it into a data frame again, uh, so it's nicer to look at, essentially. Um, and I'm going to keep the columns the way they originally were. All right. Let's check it out. I think we're done pre-processing now. That took a long time, uh, but it for such a sort of messy data set, uh, we it required a bunch of processing. All right, so here's our data, fully scaled, fully processed, no missing values. Uh, we're good to go. Uh, our y also is ones, zeros, ones, and twos, and the unique values are like this. So, uh, I think we are ready to start building the model. All right, let's also, instead of looking at the unique values, let's look at the value counts. This will tell us the distribution of the classes. That's ah, pretty even, uh, so not, not much to worry about there. Uh, let us do a train test split. So we're just going to use the train test split function from sklearn, and we're going to split each of our inputs and the y uh, in the same uh, manner. So x, descriptions, tweets, and y are getting split with a train size of 70%, and I'll include a random state as well. Um, this is just so we can reproduce the results. Uh, this function actually also shuffles the data, so this will uh, ensure that the data is always shuffled in the same uh, manner. Okay, so uh, we're going to split this into 
I believe, eight new sets of the data. X train, X test, descriptions train, descriptions test, tweets train, tweets test, and Y train, Y test. Um, now we have these eight new sets and we can begin modeling. Okay. So let's start by defining our inputs. Uh, like I said, we're going to use three inputs, X, descriptions, and the tweets, and we're going to input them separately. So I'm going to create three different inputs here, X inputs, uh, description inputs, and tweets, uh, tweet inputs, I'll call it. And each one uh, is going to be tf.keras.input. So we are using Keras to set up this model. Uh, and we sp specify the shape. It's going to be a vector of length. Uh, uh, the first one will be uh, x.shape sub 1, which if we look at it, x looks like this, right? So x.shape is 18,000 examples by 18 features. And we want to input a feature vector at a time. So we just want the sub 1 value, which is 18. So we're inputting a vector of length 18 is essentially what this is saying. For the description inputs, uh, we have 62 values in a sequence, right? Because this is of uh, each sequence is 62 long. So this will be descriptions.shape, and this last one will be tweets.shape, the very same way. Uh, just the first, the second dimension here, the uh, horizontal dimension. All right, and now we have the three inputs. We're going to process each one separately. Uh, first, let's do x. So we're going to have two dense layers, uh, sorry, x dense 1 and x dense 2. And this is just going to be a standard neural network section uh, with tf.keras.layers.dense. Um, I found 256 activations works and a ReLU activation function. Uh, to the first one, I'm going to pass in x inputs. And to the second one, I'm going to pass in x dense 1. So this guy, this first input, is just being fed through these two uh, dense layers, and that's it. Then our descriptions, uh, we're going to embed the sequences. So I talked about this earlier. We're going to use a tf.keras.layers.embedding layer. And the embedding layer is going to take each, um, each sequence, and it's going to send each word to a new location in a high dimensional vector space. And uh, I'm going to call it desk embedding. And this embedding layer will take in three arguments, an input dimension, an output dimension, output dim, and an input length. The input length is very straightforward. That's just going to be the length of a given sequence, uh, which will be given by desk.shape sub 1. Now the input dimension, uh, you can think of this as sort of um, a mapping from a sparse encoding to a dense encoding. And if we look at desk, which is our, our sequences, uh, each one of these words, remember there's 20,000 total um, over here. I specified that we're only using the top 20,000 words. Uh, so there's 20,000 total unique words in this whole set of sequences. And um, each word is going to be mapped to a um, new location. Now, if we were to, per to have a sparse encoding, which is just another word for one-hot encoding in the case of uh, these words, then each uh, word would have to be represented as a vector of length 20,000. Uh, the reason being, we'd have 20,000 zeros, or 19,999 zeros and a single one wherever the word uh, is represented by. And that's a lot of space to use. To have 20,000 columns in your data is a waste. So what instead we do is we map that vector of length 20,000. So our input dimension is 20,000 and we're mapping it to a new dimension, uh, a new dimensional space of our choosing. So I found 256 works 
Generally, the more intricate the connections between the words, the higher dimension space you need. Uh, but what this will do is now send um, each one of these uh, words to a new location in 256 dimensional vector space. And the model will actually learn where to send them. So we don't have to worry about where they go, but it's also important to note that now each word can be represented as a vector of length 256, which is a lot better than represented by a vector of length 20,000. Uh, so uh, this will embed our words, and I'm going to pass in the inputs from the desk inputs. Now, this will output, uh, let's see if I can actually get it, desk embedding dot shape. If we look at the shape of this, uh, it takes, this is just batch size, so don't worry about that. This here is the number of, of uh, words in a sequence, right? That's the, that's the length of, a, of, of each sequence. So this is the number of words, and each word is 256 uh, elements long, because each one is now represented as a 256 dimensional vector. Now, because this is two dimensional, uh, we're going to have some a hard time feeding it into the later parts of the model, so I'm going to flatten it, which will just take all of the, uh, the rows and put them side by side so that we have one long vector. Uh, so, desk flatten equals tf dot keras dot flatten dot no dot layers dot flatten and pass in desk embedding. All right, and now here's a uh, where it gets a little more complicated. I'm not only going to send the embedded words to the final uh, prediction. I'm also going to run the words, the embedded words, through a GRU, which is a form of long short-term memory network uh, layer, which uh, is a form of of RNN. I'm not going to go deeply into the math behind it, it's a little complex, but definitely take a look at it in your own time if you are interested, it's fascinating stuff. Um, but what we're going to do is create this GRU, it stands for Gated Recurrent Unit, which is just a simplified version of an LSTM. Um, so desk GRU, I'll call it. And basically the, the purpose of a GRU is to capture time dependencies between the words. Uh, an RNN takes as input a given word, but also the previous word. And so each time it sees a new word, it, it considers um, the past as well as the present. Uh, and we can get it with tf.keras.layers.gru. Uh, we'll use 256 units. Um, and we're going to say return sequences equals false. So return sequences, uh, if we had it on, it would return a new sequence for each time step, for each new word it sees. Uh, but if we have it on false, it will just return the final output. And that's what I want here. It seems to be uh, performing well with this. So I'm going to pass in the embeddings to the GRU as well. OK, so notice that the embedding is now being passed into the GRU, but also into the flatten layer. So uh, what we're going to do now is take the word embeddings, which have been flattened right here, and the GRU output, and concatenate them together. So I'll call it desk concat. And if this is a little mind-boggling, it's okay, because I will visualize it later with a uh, by plotting the model. tf.keras.layers.concatenate, and I'm going to concatenate uh, the GRU output and the flatten output. So all that does, uh, this outputs a single vector, uh, because we have return sequences on false, and this outputs a single vector because we flattened it. So it's going to take these two vectors and just put them side by side, and that single vector that is now called desk and cat uh, is going to contain all the information uh, from the description uh, sequences. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to do it for tweets, and luckily uh, it's exactly the same. So I'm just going to copy this over, and I'm going to change this to tweet. So over here will be tweets.shape. 
over here will it will be tweets tweet inputs right we're feeding in tweet inputs now and here will be tweet GRU tweet flatten tweet concat uh, here we're feeding in tweet embedding tweet embedding to these to both of these and then we're concatenating tweet GRU and tweet flatten okay and now we have fed all three of our inputs through a um, its own little path and then at the end we're going to concatenate all three of them using another concatenation layer uh, so the output of x is dense2 so x dense2 comes in the output of description is desk concat so desk concat comes in and the output of tweets is tweet concat so tweet concat comes in and then finally our outputs will be a dense layer with three values and a softmax activation function so here uh, these are the three the probability values for each class male female or um, brand and softmax ensures that their values between 0 and 1 uh, so that they take on uh, they can be used as probability estimates then we're passing in concat to here and this will be the final output okay now uh, we'll create a model a tf.keras.model the inputs is going to be as a triple input model going to be these three x inputs desk inputs and tweet inputs And the outputs is just going to be a single output, uh, which will be the outputs layer here, which is just these three activations. All right, and then we are actually, let's make this into a function so we, we can build as many models as we like. Call it build model. Uh, we could do a bunch more with this. We could compile it within the, the function. I'm not going to do it, but definitely possible. We could also specify arguments to pass in if we want to change these easily. Uh, and I'm just going to return the model at the end. So this defines the function that will build our model. Now we're actually going to build it, store it in model. And let's take a look at what it looks like. So we're going to print out a summary. And we're going to plot it with model. And we're passing in model here. All right, let's take a look. So here is what the model looks like. Now it's it's a little a little um, intense. <laughs> we have three different inputs: one for the descriptions, one for the tweets, and then in the middle here is one for the regular x values. The regular x is getting passed through two dense layers and then sent to the concatenation layer. The descriptions and the tweets are both being embedded. Uh, the embeddings are being sent to a GRU and to a flatten, uh, both like uh, respectively, and then those two outputs are getting concatenated back together. Same thing's happening over here. Those get concatenated. And then the final three outputs of each input get concatenated to one uh, big vector. And that is sent to a dense layer uh, to give our final three uh, values. And here you can see a list of all the parameters that are being tuned in this model. Um, so we have the embedding. This is the weights that actually are learning where to send the words in uh, 256 dimensional space. This is just some dense weights. Uh, here's the GRU weights. Again, if you want to understand this, uh, you should look it up. Uh, here's the other GRU for the tweets. And then here's uh, the the dense, I don't know whether they're split up like this, dense two and dense three are actually just these two right here. And then we have uh, the final weights are in the connection between our final dense layer and the concatenation, so between these two columns. Um, all right, and I guess we can begin training. So we'll start. We'll first just compile the model. We we'll use an atom optimizer. Loss will be sparse categorical cross entropy, and for metrics, we'll use accuracy. Then we'll set up a batch size, 32, number of epochs. Uh, generally, when using GRUs, you only have to train for a very small number of epochs. Usually, it's fit uh, 
best by the first or second epoch. So I'm just going to train for three epochs. And when I call the um, fit function, I'm going to include a callback that will save the best epoch weights. So model.fit, um, we're going to pass in our inputs, which is just the train set for x, the train set for descriptions, the train set for tweets, and our y, our output, which will just be the train set for y. Then we're going to include a validation split. We'll use 20% of our train data for validation, so 0.2. And then uh, batch size will be batch size that we just specified. Epochs will be the epochs we just specified. And I'm going to include a callback function, like I said, tf.keras.callbacks uh, model checkpoint. And this will let us save uh, a HDF5 file with our model weights. Uh, we can enable save weights only, since we're just going to be loading the weights. And also, uh, we're going to save best only. That will ensure that we save only the best epoch so that we can load it up later. All right, um, I'd also like to just include this callback, which will help us converge a little more easily, uh, reduce learning rate on plateau. OK. And there we go. Let's train it up. Um, I should have enabled GPU acceleration. Uh, GRUs can be slow to train. So I'm going to restart the notebook. Uh, I'm going to enable GPU acceleration, restart the notebook, and I'll continue the video when I'm done training. All right, we're finished training. And uh, let us now load in the weights, model.load weights, of the best model. And we save that with model checkpoint. You can see there's a model.h5 saved here. So we'll just access that, model.h5, load it in. And let's take a look at the results. So uh, let's evaluate the, the model, model.evaluate, on the test set. So we're passing in x test, desk test, and tweets test as our input. And we're comparing it to y test on the output. Let's store that in results. And I'm also going to enable verbose um, and turn off verbose mode. And then we'll print out model accuracy. And we'll display a accuracy value to two decimal places with a percent sign after. So dot format, and I'm going to pass in results uh, sub 1. If I do sub 0, it will be the loss value for the test set. And if I do sub 1, it will be the accuracy value for the test set. So I'm going to multiply that by 100 to get the percentage. And uh, we can see we have a model accuracy of 64 0.27%, which is actually quite good. Um, I was looking at some other notebooks, and it seems like many people were getting uh, around like 45% using some Bayesian models, and then with logistic regression uh, and uh, some, I think, some gradient boosting, um, they were getting something closer to this. Uh, but based on the other notebooks I saw, this looks like a very uh, decent result. Um, and let's just get a little more information about the results. So why true? This is going to be an, a NumPy array of all of the correct answers to the test set, which is just given by y test. I'm going to turn it into a NumPy array. And then y prediction, y pred, is going to be the predictions given by model.predict on the test set. So I'm going to pass in the test inputs here. So te x test, desk test tweets test. Um, and then I'm going to, okay, so if we just take a look at what this returns, just the prediction, uh, you'll see it returns three different probability values for each example, as that's what we set it to, to return, right? These three values with the softmax activation. So I don't want probability values. I want uh, the index of the highest probability, which will be our class our actual classification. Uh, so what I'll do is map a function to ypred. So we're going to map this lambda function to ypred. And the lambda function is going to take in an x, which will be a given one of these three values. And it's going to return numpy.argmax of x. So uh, max will return the, here let me show you, 
numpy.max will return uh, the maximum value of a list. argmax, on the other hand, will return the index of the maximum value, which is very useful. Um, this will essentially say which class has the highest activate um, highest probability. Uh, so once we've mapped it, we're just going to uh, turn it into a list. Currently it's a map object, so we turn it into a list, and then we'll turn it into a numpy array after that. All right, so now our y true looks like that, our y pred looks like that, and we're going to compare the results. So I'm going to create a confusion matrix called CM, and that's going to compare y true and y pred. And I'm going to create a classification report. These are both functions from sklearn, um, very useful for examining the results of a classification task. So here I'm also going to pass in y true compared to y pred. And I'm going to uh, set my own target names so that I have some more um, understanding. Currently the targets are 0, 1, and 2. I'm just going to set them back to female, male, and brand so that we can more easily understand what we're looking at. All right, we created those and let's plot the results. I'm going to use matplotlib to create a new figure here with a fig size of, uh, I guess, six by six works for a confusion matrix. Um, and we're going to plot it with Seaborn, a heat map of CM, which is our confusion matrix. I'm going to turn on annotations so we can see the actual count values. Um, I'm going to say format equals G to avoid having the counts uh, show in scientific notation turning off the color bar here and I'm going to turn on I mean, I'm going to set the color map to blues all right now I'm just gonna uh, put some stuff on the axis if we look at it right now uh, you can see the values but I'm gonna make it look a little nicer so I'm gonna give it some ticks on the x-axis um, so I have to specify the spacings for them which we can get with numpy dot a range 3 which will generate 3 it'll just be 0 1 and 2 and then we can add 0.5 to, instead of centering at the edges, we'll center in the middle. So 0.5 will be right in the middle of each one. And then the labels, uh, it's just gonna be these labels here. So I'm gonna do the same exact thing for the Y ticks as well. And then I'll give some labels. So X label is going to be predicted values. Uh, the Y label is going to be actual values and we'll give it a title, Confusion Matrix. Okay, so now it looks a little nicer. We can see the number of predicted um, values for each category and the compared with the number of actual values for each category. And this goes side by side with the, the classification report. So I'm just gonna display that before, before I analyze them. Uh, so we call that CLR. And here we go. Uh, we can now take a look at how we did. So um, it looks like the best, the most easily classified category was a brand. You can see our precision and recall values are the highest in that. And the F1 score, this is sort of like a, a combination of precision and recall. Um, I believe it's uh, the formula for F1 score is two times precision times recall all over precision plus recall. Um, which uh, takes on a value between 0 and 1 and sort of demonstrates the overall performance uh, in a given category. So if we look at, uh, let's look at female first. So female, we have a precision of 0.6. This means that out of all of the predicted values for female, right? so this is which one we predicted, here are all the female predictions, and you can see their distribution across uh, what they actually were. So we got most of them correct. 1,385 of the predicted females were actually female. Um, 653 of our predictions were wrong and they were actually male. And 260 of our predictions were wrong as well and they were actually brand. So 60% um, of our values were correct. 
in the predictions. That's why we have a precision of 0.6. We have a recall of 0.69. That's looking at these. Uh, this is saying out of all the actual female values, 69% uh, of them were correct. You can see that uh, out of all the actual values that were female, we got 1,385 of them correct. Now 490 of them we misclassified as male, and 129 of them we misclassified as brand. For male, we have a precision of 0.54, which means uh, out of our predicted male values, this column here, we got 54% of them correct, which is not so good. So it looks like male was probably our worst uh, category. It was the hardest for the model to classify males, which is interesting. Um, so we got 54% uh, of them correct, and the other 46% uh, were distributed between uh, incorrect classifications. Uh, they were actually female, we classified as male, or they were actually brand classified as male. And uh, you can see that we actually misclassified more real females as males than we did more real brands as males. Then the recall score for male uh, is this row here. We have a 55%. That's because 55% of this row we did correct. And then we misclassified, um, well, okay, so a bunch of the males a bunch of the uh, users that were actually male, we misclassified as female, you can see. Not so many in the brand case. So many of the actual males, we did not mis... Like, uh, it seems like very few of the records who were actually male, we misclassified as brand. So that's why we have a recall of 55%. And then for the brand, uh, we have 82% re precision, which is quite good. Uh, that's because out of our all of our predicted brand values. You see, we, we misclassified very few brand values. We got many correct. Uh, and here, you can see just about equal. Uh, we, mis we, we classified 140 males as brand, and we classified 120 na uh, females as brand. And for our recall uh, in the brand, we have 68%. Not as good as our precision. You can see that's because we um, we misclassified a bunch of the actual brands um, as female and male. However, all in all, I think the model is doing well. Um, gender is one of those targets that's particularly difficult to predict because um, people are different and it's not so clear cut what someone's gender is based on their Twitter profile. Um, I, I, I believe all of these were taken from like, like a user identified um, genders. So, uh, yeah, there's only so much information in the data that we can use to predict gender. But I think it was overall a success. <coughs> I know this was a very long video with a very complex model, and um, if you watched the whole thing, thank you so much for sticking through. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content, and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.